in the video clip you just saw, you saw a neutral object, which was a ruler, being attracted to a charged object, which was a piece of foam. And I want to go and use that as an example that leads into what intermolecular forces are. And so, the other common example of this is if you have a balloon, and you rub the balloon on your head, and you stick that to the wall, but the balloon will stick to the wall. And here we have a charged object, which is the balloon. And we have a neutral object, which is the wall. And somehow the balloon attracts to the wall, and there's an attraction between them that allows it enough friction force to stay up on the wall. I want to use that to describe how it's possible for two neutral objects to attract to each other, two molecules that are charge balanced to stick together. That's kind of the problem that we're going to. So to start off with, we're going to look at this simulation here where we're looking at what happens when we put the balloon on the wall. So if I take the balloon here in this simulation and rub it on the sweater, it gets the negative charge. But the key for the sticking to the wall is that when you bring the balloon nearby, the negative charge of this will cause the negative charges in the wall, even though the wall is neutral, they will cause them to move. And what ends up happening is I end up forming a negative end of the wall and a positive end of the wall. So even though the wall overall is neutral, I end up forming kind of a charged component to it where it's one charge on one side and the opposite charge on the other. And we have a fancy name for that and it's called polarization or polarizing. I polarized the wall by putting this negative charge by it because the electrons were free to move to some degree within that wall, which allows a charged object to stick to a neutral object. Interestingly, a charged object will always stick to a neutral object because of this polarization. So, what we want to do from this is we want to stretch this into, well, what if I had two objects that neither of them were net charge? Both of them are neutral. Why then would those two things stick together? And so if we go and look at intermolecular forces, the idea is that we have some kind of atom here and another atom here, and somehow those two things have a force of attraction between them. The thing to keep in mind is that even though these atoms or molecules are neutral overall, they have charged pieces to them. They have protons and they have electrons, and the electrons are very much so in motion. And so if you could freeze frame at any given time where those electrons are, you might see more electrons to one side than the other which means that that side would have a negative charge and the other side would have a more positive charge. In fact, you've, you've temporarily, for an instant, polarized this particular atom or molecule. And a nearby atom or molecule also has electrons, so its electrons are going to now shift more towards the side with a positive end on it, which means that this now has a negative end and a positive end. So merely by the fact that electrons are moving around in statistical analysis and whatnot, we have that these will eventually end up where one of them has a positive and negative charge for a brief fleeting instant. And when that happens, another atom or molecule nearby will also polarize and there will be an attractive force between them. If we go back to the original image, why does this attract to this? The thing you have to keep in mind is that the electrons here are attracted to the positive charge and repelled by the negative charge. So for a neutral wall where nothing moves, there would be no net attraction. There would be an equal amount of repulsion and attraction. But because it's polarized, the positive end is closer than the negative end. So we get a larger force of attraction than we get force of repulsion. And so therefore, we get a net force of attraction that allows this balloon to be pulled towards the wall and inevitably stick to it. If we come back to here, the negative end of this being close to the positive end means I get a stronger attractive force than I get repulsion between the other two ends. Now, when this happens, when it's temporary like this, when I have two neutral molecules that really have no reason to stick together other than this temporary momentary dipole, that is called a dispersion force or a London dispersion force. It is the weakest of, of intermolecular forces and this is just something that, that basically means anything will stick to anything on some level due to this temporary dipole action. Okay? When we look at intermolecular forces, there's a second kind where it's more permanent in nature. So for molecules that are polarized permanently, those are given the term dipole or dipole-dipole interactions, where instead of just for a brief moment I have electrons more to one side than the other, permanently I have more electrons to one side than the other, and that's a stronger interaction than dispersion forces. There's a third kind that we'll talk about in a second. Now, for dispersion forces, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that the more electrons you have, the more of this shifting and polarization you're going to get. And so more electrons leads to a stronger or, or greater polarizability. 
and that means that the dispersion forces will be stronger. And there's a classic example of this, where if you look at the halogens, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, those are all neutral nonpolar molecules. They all have dispersion forces only. Chlorine yet is a gas, bromine a liquid, and iodine is a solid, because as I move down this group, I'm accruing more electrons, and the larger number of electrons makes the dispersion forces stronger, which you can see from the result that at normal temperature and pressure, state of matter is different for them. There's a third type of intermolecular force called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is an extremely poorly chosen name. We really should get rid of this and change its name to something else. Hydrogen bonding is very confusing because it's an intermolecular force, not a bond. And it is influenced by bonding. So when you have an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, or a nitrogen bonded to a hydrogen, or a fluorine bonded to a hydrogen, hydrogen bonding will occur. But the hydrogen bond is not the bond between the hydrogen and the atom. Rather, it is that on a second molecule of whatever has this hydrogen oxygen bonded, there's an interaction between the two molecules. If there's a second molecule with nitrogen and hydrogen, there's an interaction between those two molecules. Now, hydrogen bonding is the exact same thing as a dipole interaction. It just turns out to be unusually strong when you pair those two sets of atoms together. So if you have a pair of hydrogen and oxygen, or of nitrogen and hydrogen, or fluorine and hydrogen, you'll see an unusually strong attraction between them. So we can go through and look at an image of that. This is a graph that goes through and shows a melting point or boiling point, I don't remember which. So and that's not in English, so that's not going to help me. But nonetheless, this is something that indicates either melting or boiling point for four different substances. And what we can see is that as we go from tellurium to selenium to sulfur, that the, the melting point is decreased. I'm sorry, here we go, boiling point. The boiling point is dropping as I move down, as we said before, because the dispersion forces involved are weakening. Yet for some reason, there's a tremendous spike when I get to water. Now, if I do that for a different group with tin, germanium, silicon, and carbon, I don't see that spike. So this spike we see any time that we have oxygen and hydrogen bonded, any time we have nitrogen and hydrogen bonded, or hydrogen and fluorine bonded. So these are all polar molecules. They all have a dipole interaction. But for some reason, this one stands out as being extremely stronger. And that comes up a lot in biology and in biochemistry and honestly even in chemistry quite a bit that this effect uh, will, will accompany something of, of importance. And so for that reason, we, we created a third category, even though this is really the same thing as this, it's just an exceptionally strong version of that, that arises as the proton from the hydrogen gets exposed from the very electronegative and small atoms bonded to it. So these are our three types of intermolecular forces. Let's go through how you can figure out which one you have based on what we're looking at. So, Ideally here, you know how to draw a Lewis structure, and you know how to go through and assign electronegativity values. But if you don't, there are things that will do that. This is a website that will display what the electron density of a molecule is. And this is great for looking at intermolecular forces. When you see red, that means there's a negative charge on that side. When you see blue, there's a positive charge. And permanently. Not the case of a dispersion force where it's a temporary alignment. But this side will always have a somewhat negative charge, and this side will always have a somewhat positive charge. Now, this is an attraction between another molecule. So another hydrofluoric acid is up here. The hydrogen end of that is attracted to the fluorine there. This is my hydrogen bond between the two. So the fact that this is polar means that I have a dipole interaction, and that it's a hydrogen and a fluorine means that it's the specific kind, the hydrogen bond. We can look at other examples that are different. So if I pull up nitrogen gas, nitrogen is not polar. There's no positive or negative end to it. And so for this, the type of intermolecular force would be dispersion forces only. The dispersion forces are generally speaking weaker than hydrogen bonding or dipole, and so that makes sense given that nitrogen is a gas at normal temperature and pressure, that it would have weak attractive forces. If we go ahead and pull up a couple more, we can go through and assign what their intermolecular forces would be. Here is a fluoromethane, uh, so a fluorine atom, and then carbon to three hydrogens. Now this is polar has a positive end and a negative end. So therefore we would expect this to be a dipole interaction. 
There is a fluorine, but the fluorine is not bonded to any of the hydrogens. It's bonded to the carbon. So this would not be hydrogen bonding. This would just be a dipole interaction. Then there are some molecules that are interesting because they will have a negative end and a negative end, or a positive end and a positive end. And for molecules like that, there's not a good way to align multiples of those molecules into one kind of crystalline structure. And so even though maybe two of these could attract each other, 50 of them could not. And so this is considered to be not polar, and this would therefore just be dispersion forces. And we can confirm that because carbon dioxide is a gas at normal temperature and pressure, and so it's not a surprise that we have weak intermolecular forces. Now, a final note on intermolecular forces that's very critical. It's important to really understand that when we're saying intermolecular forces, what we're saying and what we're not saying. So this is a, another simulation that is very helpful for this. I'm going to freeze it. So this is solid oxygen here. And you see that the oxygen, of course, is diatomic. It's O2. There's two interactions going on here. One is that there's a bond between the oxygen atoms. These come in pairs. So the oxygen atoms being bonded together is a covalent bond. It's a very strong interaction. But in addition to that, each molecule is clustered into a crystal structure. And what's holding the molecules together are the intermolecular forces. If I start to heat this, those are going to be what breaks apart, but the O2 is going to remain. So if I take this and hit play, and I make this into a gas, you'll note that the pairs remain. So the pairs are still there because the covalent bond is still present between the two oxygen atoms. But what I've done is I've disrupted this from interacting with everything else. So I've broken apart the intermolecular force, not the bond. Now, obviously all of these things arise from positive charges and negative charges, but the interaction here, this bond, is much, much, much stronger than the intermolecular force or the dispersion forces between the separate molecules. So intermolecular forces deal with things that are in a much lower energy level than what we would see for things involving bonding. Here we have water and ice. And you'll note that the hydrogen end is usually aligned with the oxygen end, so the negative and positive ends are, are showing an intermolecular force. It's stronger than an oxygen, which was dispersion forces. So here, for water, we're looking at hydrogen bonding. And that's a much stronger attraction, and that's actually part of the reason why you see the shape that you do there for that kind of hexagon that pops up every once in a while in that structure. Uh, and so this is what ice would look like, if we could kind of zoom in and magic school bus the whole thing. And, and so here you're seeing an intermolecular force in addition to the covalent bond within the molecule. So the H2O, the hydrogens and the oxygens, are covalently bonded together here within the molecule. But then that molecule sticks to this molecule and sticks to this molecule. Those three things sticking together is an intermolecular force, the hydrogen bonding. The actual molecule staying, sticking within itself, that's the covalent bonding. Okay. The final thing you want to be able to do with intermolecular forces is to be able to explain why certain things happen the way that they do. So, I think that it's wise to think of intermolecular forces in a similar way to being sticky. So the stronger the intermolecular force, the stickier the molecules to other molecules. So hydrogen bonding would be a sticky intermolecular force, dispersion force is generally speaking not very sticky. So, for things like viscosity, if something is hydrogen bonding, you would expect it to be more viscous as it's more sticky. Uh, and here I have some ethylene glycol, which has hydrogen bonding. And you'll see that it takes a, a decent chunk of time for that marble to go down to the bottom. And then I have glycerin. And glycerin has a significant quantity of hydrogen bonding in it. And so therefore you can see that the viscosity of this is almost to the point where I can't even do this. Uh, the ability of the marble to break through the intermolecular force is phenomenally difficult. Let me see if I can get this to or not. And so along those lines, vapor pressure, uh, vapor pressure is something that if you have a very sticky molecules, you'll produce very little vapor, so you'll have very low vapor pressure, as opposed to your viscosity, which is high for sticky molecules. Boiling points and melting points for sticky intermolecular forces will be high compared to those that don't. Uh, solubility uh, will come up in probably a different a, a little later, but but basically the similarities of intermolecular forces will make things soluble and differences will make them insoluble. 
And then states of matter, if things are sticky, you're going to expect to see solid or liquid as opposed to a gas. So my final little viscosity tube here is filled with methane, which is only dispersion forces, and so therefore you can see very little difficulty in breaking through the intermolecular forces of the methane as compared to the glycerin, which is finally broken free, but is now sitting there stuck in there, and you can see that it hardly moves as it has difficulty breaking through the intermolecular forces of that glycerin. So the final thing is that you really want to have a strong connection of strong intermolecular forces means sticky, and then how that explains different phenomena in chemistry, whereas weak intermolecular forces are not sticky and have the opposite effects on things.